All right. Hello, Fortinos, brothers and sisters. Welcome back to Ministry Revealed. It is February 16th, 2023. Oh, I guess it's not much of a surprise that we've missed again, right? Oh, well, we've been missing for thousands of years. Why is it any different now, right? <laughs> I know that's not what you want to hear. But brothers and sisters, there are things we know. There are things we know. The number one thing we know is Israel is back in the land. When they came back into the land, we understood it was four years and the 70 years of Israel began. All right. We have it from Leviticus. We have it from Luke 13, the fig tree, three years. Give it one more year of dung and then if not, cut it down. We have understood that revelation of four years connected to the 70. So what does that mean? That means we've got to be around here somewhere. We can't be too far off. But there are things that we know. We have understood this revelation from the Holy Ghost that gave us one physical in our realm reality in the physical world, the revelation of right on target. All right. And this right on target was all about leading us to Taurus. We have understood it. We came to understand that Taurus is the beginning. In fact, it was the beginning, which is why the Jews made it number one in their alphabet as the first letter and the first number. Because in the beginning, or when the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron and said it was the beginning of their months and the beginning of your years, the answer was Taurus. It was in Taurus, all right? It absolutely was in Taurus. And so we had gone on to study uh, for the past year that maybe there's this connection to being two months off, all right? Is it possible that everything is two months off according to the Lord God's calendar and where things are going to go? So we would, we would talk on it, and then we'd get distracted because it would land on Hebrew dates that seemed significant. And then we'd talk on it, and then we got to Hanukkah on the Hebrew calendar, and it seemed significant. And we even considered doing that in in the, if you guys were in the forum, you would have seen a, a post that I did that maybe we could have even been looking up to as late as earlier this morning, like maybe in the overnight, I'm Mountain, I'm mountain Standard Time. So... You know, maybe in the overnight, but I was like, if we wake up, nope, that wasn't it. And we're going to talk a little bit about that today. Um, and we're going to talk about a couple things, but then we're also going to talk about some more of the Gospels, some some more revelation and understanding within the Gospels. All right. So it's not just going to be a, a, a continuous seeking and searching for the date. As you guys know, that's not the focus of this ministry. Is it a big part of it? Yes, man, because we're crying out to be with the Lord. That's all we want, right? Let it come, Lord. Even so, let it come because we know that it must come. We know it. We know it must come. It's not that we want this destruction brought on the world. It's that we know it must come. And when it comes, those who were asleep, those who were blinded, many hundreds of millions will come to wake up. That's why. That's the whole purpose to the tribulation. It's not because he wants to kill everybody. It's because he wants to save as many as he can before time is up. That's what's going on. All right. So this is why. And, and in this ministry, it, it's, it's revelation that has been revealed to us. The, the eye of Taurus, the, the Aldebaran eye called right on target, that means bullseye, was, was, is called the follower or the eye of revelation. I mean, how crazy is that? That almost three years ago, the Spirit gave that to us. And what has been happening in the last five and a half years? We've been given the revelation of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. His book has opened up to us from the beginning to the end. Does it mean everything? Absolutely not. But more than it has ever been revealed in human history, hidden since the creation of the world? Absolutely without question. And it's awesome. 
That is the focus of this ministry and always has been. But it dovetails, of course, into trying to understand the season and time that the Lord is coming for the pre-trib bride. And so as we talk about some of these things, we're going to start with, with another close possibility of time, and I'm going to explain why. And then if that one comes, then no, we're going out a little bit further. But do I believe it's this year? You know, by, by latest, by summer of this year? Darn right I do. Absolutely, unequivocally, I do. Why? Because when Israel came into the land, you see, guys, there's the, there are these things that we know, right? 70 is everywhere in prophecy. And when the 70th ends, the 14 years of tribulation will begin. The revelation of the Gospels and their end time understanding will begin. We've understood this. We know it. These things aren't a mystery to us. The, <laughs> the biggest mystery is where on earth the Father is counting from. Where is our Lord and Savior counting it from? Where did the Father decide to say, this is where it's at? Okay? And so the, the question or even the answer to that comes <laughs> in what he called the beginning. What was the beginning? Taurus. Taurus was the beginning. So we have two ways in, 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 this, in this overview here, in this look that we're going to do today, that extends a little bit more to where we are still right now. But then that goes a little bit later into the year, no, but not past summer. And why? Well, because everything's about Taurus, okay? The revelation is about Taurus. And in these recent videos that we did, it was this big connection that I believe is connected to the new year of trees. When John, when Jesus said, yet four months and then comes the harvest, behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields for they are white already to harvest. This was prophetic. They're, they weren't out there harvesting when Jesus said it. He was, he was giving them a prophetic word, which I'm sure they must have been scratching their head over. We know the connection to Samaritan, which means watch. It's connected to the well, which means watch. It, it's connected to, to the other eye of Taurus, Ayin, which means watch, and it's the number 70. Noon in the beginning means Taurus. It's the beginning. And so what did this have to do with Taurus and the beginning? Well, it's because the Feast of Weeks, which is in Taurus, is being told to us four months early. Because this fields are white and ready to harvest. It has a, a conversation in it that sounds like Luke right? The white and ready to harvest. And for those that are new, if you're wondering what I'm talking about, what do you mean white for Luke? Well, let me show you something. When Christ was going to the cross, you'll see that Jesus was arrayed. Where is it? Am I too early? 22. You'll see that Jesus was arrayed in Luke in, where is it? It must have been 22 or 23 i mean i got it i got it. i think i just went too fast there it is jesus was arrayed in a gorgeous robe it means radiant bright clear gorgeous white all right even luke's name means white when you go to mark and you see what jesus was arrayed in you see that he was arrayed in or clothed arrayed in purple when you go to Matthew's gospel, you see that Jesus was arrayed in, where are you? Scarlet. So you have white, gorgeous, beautiful, you have purple, and you have scarlet. 
we know these people weren't colorblind. This is part of the revelation of the Gospels that we revealed here in this ministry. It was how the ministry began. We now understand why there are these differences within the Gospels, and it's the number one thing in this ministry to understand. And in this case, what are tribulation colors? Purple and scarlet. What's the beast riding? Purple and scarlet in Revelation, right? Gorgeous, white, radiant, beautiful robe. That's the bride. Luke is to the bride of Christ. Mark is to the sleeping church, the world, right? The Gentiles grafted in with the house of Israel. And Matthew is to the house of Judah, to the Jews. Mark's group is to seals. Matthew's group is to trumpets. You're going to see this all throughout as you come to learn and study this ministry if you're new to this ministry. And so this is something we were looking at here that we've been trying to connect and in everything appeared to line up with it. And so when, when we went in and spoke about that, we believed that it was lining up to the new year of trees. And then we said, oh, you know, the, the book of Jubilees told us that it's 10 days off every year that they would air. And so we said, oh my goodness, add 10 days. And it brought us to February 15th yesterday. Right now from Jerusalem yesterday, okay? 15th, uh, something like that, I think it was the 15th. And so we thought, great, and nothing. Well, I'm gonna hopefully bring a little bit more insight into this timing that we might still be in right now. And it's all because of what the Book of Jubilees said about a year and how many days they're off based on the moon we're going to cover that today and we're going to cover two pieces of that meaning one that's close and then one that's a little bit later because we know of this connection that it's that it's attached to all right and then we're going to go into more revelation within the gospels that i've been saving in the background <laughs> hoping we weren't going to have enough time to get into it <laughs> so Anybody that's new in the ministry and you're hearing me talk now, I do need to set you up first, which means you can either go to the Ministry Revealed website right here or go to ministryrevealed.com. Um, you, can, you can download the book for free. You can read chapter one and chapter two. They're more detailed to what I'm about to share with you here in this playlist. This playlist right here, the Revealed End Type Study Note series, uh, you'll hear me sometimes talk about the forum. The forum is free to join from the website. There's over 1,100 people from around the world, all like-minded brothers and sisters watching, seeking, doing Bible studies, sharing, sharing insights and ideas and thoughts and news and events around the world, all in there. You can comment, you can post, you can just watch it as it comes up, all right? And it won't cost you a dime, and it's uh, it'll take you, I think, just a few seconds to sign up. But I would recommend you start right here. Click on playlists. Come to this one right here, the end time, uh, the revealed end time study note series. All right. And when you do, this is what's going to come up. There's 11 videos here. It doesn't mean you have to go into all 11. But what I can tell you and what I do recommend is at least these first three. The, these are all Bible studies. All right. This one right here is the beginning of it all. It's called Who the Gospels Are Speaking To. If you've ever wondered things like I was just sharing, were, were these guys colorblind when they wrote the Gospels? Okay, how about things like this? Let me show you another incredible one. How about this? When Jesus goes to the cross, in Matthew, as he's saying his last words, he says, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? which means to leave behind. Was Jesus left behind? No, of course he wasn't left behind. When you go to Mark's, look at what he says. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Leave me behind, right? Well, look at what it says in Luke's. It's the same story as the Gospels when I showed the colors of the robes and the mystery of the prophetic understanding that is throughout the Gospels that had never been understood before. 
we reveal it here in this ministry and that's what that first intro video is going to show you listen to what he says in luke father into thy hands i commend meaning place alongside my spirit well how is that why on earth did luke record something so different do you know what the prophetic implication of this understanding is it's because luke represents the bride of christ they are the spirit group they are spirit filled in christ the mark and the matthew group are the left behind those who will go through seals and those who will go through trumpets so what does this imply it implies that pre mid and post are all true you ever wonder why there have been so many scriptures and why there have been so much debate over whether it's pre mid or post the answer is they're all true and as you begin to understand this first intro video it's only six pages typed out that i read from it's the intro and if you want greater depth go to the website you can download the book for free in pdf it's in five different languages or if you wanted a hard a, a paperback you can actually get it from amazon all right and you're going to see that pre mid and post are all true so as you begin to understand who the gospels are speaking to you can then come to this video number five and understand that pre mid and post are all true but then it's going to start to freak you out because as you begin to understand why there's all these differences why these things seemed like contradictions in the scriptures you're going to realize it had nothing to do with contradictions you're going to realize so many people that walked away because they just thought it was contradicting you're now going to have the answer to be able to help them explain that the difference is prophetic prophecy was built into all throughout the gospels and when you understand that you're going to suddenly realize uh oh the discourses are all different as well for a reason and you're going to understand in this 11th video here luke mark and matthew the discourse of luke is very different from that of mark and matthew and that's because luke's is a 40 50 day period of time before this 14 years of tribulation begin what yeah 14 years you're going to realize that it's two sets of seven it is seven years of seals and you have the great multitude rapture in the seventh year of seals and then you have the lord's return feet down on the mount of olives at the end of the sixth year start of the seventh year of trumpets where he brings the final devastation against the enemy he renews everything brings them back from the place they were hidden for the last three and a half years of trumpets in the second half you will begin to understand it but you have to first start with who the gospels are speaking to when you do you'll understand that those differences are clearly showing that there are two sets of seven years we it's it's not made up it's not that we've guessed it we can prove it all the way back to the story of creation in fact it's not just two sets of seven it's actually three but the first three are quote unquote easy meaning we're living in them right now we're prayerfully at the very end of the final days or the final few weeks of that final first seven okay it's a short period of time of 40 50 days before the 14 years begins and it's all revealed even in the creation story it will blow your mind but you're going to see this that the truth is 14. that's why mark's discourse and matthew's discourse are very similar yet still very different if you go read matthew's discourse most people don't know that matthew's discourse continues into matthew 25. it's the whole discourse there's no red letter changing to black it's red letter the whole way most people don't realize that okay and they get confused and so where does this confusion come from that's why you want to watch the third video the answer is found in this video it's all because of matthew and it's because for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years the whole church the whole seminary of teachers and everybody 
have been taught from a foundation of the Gospel of Matthew. So everything they see comes from a perspective of Matthew and they don't realize it as they're reading other parts of Scripture. So all they see is seven years because all they focus on is the seven years to Matthew. They have not understood who Mark is speaking to and they have not understood who Luke is speaking to. You see? So when somebody says pre-trib, the whole church is going pre-trib, that's because they're learning from the Gospel of Matthew and they think everybody goes pre-trib before the seven years begins. Well, guess what? They'd be right in that thinking, except where does that put them? It puts them at the end of Mark's Gospel. Which means what? They failed to understand that there was seven years of Mark's group, of, of the house of Israel, the world, the Gentiles connected in there. That came first. If they had understood who Mark was speaking to, you would understand there is another set of seven years. It will blow your mind. And all of the confusion came because we were taught from Matthew, but I believe it's because the Lord hid it for the time of the end. And one of the biggest reasons is the Lord God's harvest. I don't know if you guys know this, All most of you listening do, but anybody new, you may not realize it, but the harvest model that the Lord God has told us in his word is first fruits, main harvest, corners and gleaning. So the Luke group is the first fruits of the harvest that gets to go first. The main harvest, which is like 85 or so percent that, that's left out of the 90, is the great multitude rapture, the main harvest. That's Mark's group. And when the Lord returns, it's the corners and gleaning. That may be 5% or less to make a total of 100%. That is the big picture of the three groups and their harvests. It will blow your mind. I promise you, start with these three. Go to, minist go to ministryrevealed.com, download the PDF of the book or get the book, read just the first two chapters to start, and you will see for yourself. It will blow you away and you will be so excited because you will never read the scriptures the same again because you'll have such an incredible understanding of who is being spoken to when. And now more than ever, it makes a huge, huge difference. Why? Because Israel is back in the land and the time of the end is upon us. All right? It's a big deal. And I am so grateful to have, to have been able to share it and to grow in it and to draw closer and, and to have all of you guys come with us on this journey to, to diligently draw into the Lord closer and closer and closer. All right, guys, it's awesome. So please, if you're new, go and do that, all right? Now, what we're gonna get into here is, that's what I want to share. So let's get going with this in relation to things we've been talking about from the last video. I should probably delete this last video, but we'll see how it goes here um, after, you know, this Sunday to Monday. All right. So I just told you when, <laughs> when the next possibility is. Now, in that last video, the reason we were excited was for was for a number of reasons. All right. But you're going to see something with this taking place again today. You're going to see this conversation pop up again today. They will air. Okay. We know that they aired. Okay. They're errors. We, we spoke about this in recent videos. Uh, we spoke about it a bit in the last video. Uh, Mike over at 165, he was talking about, he talks about it regularly as well. And we've understood this, that when you see this in scripture, you never read about tribulation in Luke. You never read about a, a rebuke 
to the Luke group. You never read about Luke's group having erred, but you find it over and over again when it comes to the Mark group and the Matthew group. So if you're new, like I said, who is this Mark group? They might believe in Christ. So first of all, it's it's the world as a whole. Okay? And within it, there are those who believe in Christ, but they're not prepared. They're not watching. They're not diligent in the Lord. Okay? They just err in their ways. They're more caught up with the things of the world and spend little time outside of Sunday really giving thanks and seeking the Lord. That's kind of the biggest difference. Okay? The Luke group are those in the Spirit, Spirit filled. They might be in the flesh right now, but they are living by the Spirit. Does it mean that they're perfect? No. It means that they repent. They love their brothers and sisters. They're they're diligently seeking. All right? This is the difference. And then, of course, the Matthew group is the house of Judah. And what you come to find out throughout Scripture is that the world, okay, the world, the house of Israel, the sleeping church, you call it, those not ready, and Judah, they have erred. And we've talked about it quite a bit recently. And one of the things they've erred on, of course, is also within their calendar. And when we spoke about this in the last video, along with many other things, that we were just like, man, this has got to be it, right? This has got to be it. There was just so many incredible connections to me that's why i was so excited i was like everything appeared to be there including the part that we've understood here from john chapter 4. this is the only place where the fields white because of the um with the fields white because of the almond tree and the almond blossoms were this lined up and made sense. So there was a connection to winter. There was a connection to the almond blossoms. Um, uh, uh, we saw from Jeremiah 1, there was an almond branch. And, and then it was, it was the seething pot coming from the north that he saw next. And we know that that's connected to the year's end when, uh, when Syria comes to attack at the end of the 50 days, right at the beginning of the 14 years, when Jerusalem is attacked and they flee. I mean, there are things that we've understood, brothers and sisters, that we know. <laughs> and these connections, I mean, how could we not have been excited? How could I not have been excited? I mean, it was gung-ho. But what was the piece that helped us go 10 days more? It was the Book of Jubilees. Okay? And if you were in the forum the other day, I posted when that time came that maybe we can give it another day and a half. And the reason I did was because this. You see, Jubilees talks about the, the moon coming out 10 days earlier every year. Okay? So they've erred because the moon is 10 days early every year. Well, then it also goes on and says that a year for 364 days. But what have we made in the observations of the moon? In fact, doesn't that even say it? Doesn't that even talk about it here? Watch this. Uh, that they forget not the festivals of my covenant and walk according to the festivals of the Gentiles after their errors. Okay, so you got Gentiles errors and you got Jew errors. And after their ignorance, and there will be those who will make observations of the moon for this one the moon corrupts the stated times and comes out early each year by 10 days what do we know the fact is about these 10 days well when i posted in the forum the other day that hey maybe we can give it another day and a half because what do we know we know that the moon doesn't corrupt every year by only 10 days. It's actually by about 11 and a quarter days. But when we woke up this morning, 
Well, then I realized it couldn't have been just that kind of count, meaning we can't be here in February and just say, oh, it's 11 and a quarter days and that's it. No, because what do we know about this? Well, we've studied the moon, haven't we? We've made observations of the moon, haven't we? Then what else do we read? We read that a year is 364 days. Well, is a year really 364? No, it's 365 and a quarter. So you have a day and a quarter extra on the moon in our reality, and you have a day and a quarter on the days of the sun in our reality. But what we did, what I did, is simply added 10 days and then maybe went an extra day and a quarter to see <clears throat> if that's what we were off by and that's what we were so excited about. But we've studied the moon, haven't we? <clears throat> Excuse me. And how the moon has gone off. It's said that the moon comes out 10 days too early by year. So every year, we know the moon comes out early, not by, not by uh, uh, 10 days, but by 11 and a quarter days. Every year. All right? Every year. But we also know that the Jews on the Hebrew calendar adjust every two to three years by adding an additional month that's called second Adar. Everybody knows this very well as well, okay? And when they do that, for those that are new and have never heard this before, it's something that seems so simple when you understand it, but it's so important to understand. What happens is they add 29 days every two to three years. Why did they do it? Because of the moon. Because they've fallen behind the actual annual course of the moon. So when they add a second Adar, it's because they're trying to catch up every single year. So if if you go from, you could say from January to December, right? It's 11 and a quarter, but you could also go where the Hebrews go from, right? You can go from Nisan to Nisan, and it's still gonna be 11 days and a quarter, okay? You can start from September and go to start of September. It'll be 11 days and a quarter. Okay, it's just the totality of a year. And if you always start the year in the same place, then it's always going to be 11 and a quarter. So if they're off in their moon count, just like Jubilee said, and we know according to their calendar that they are, then if they never added a second Adar every two to three years, every year they would fall behind by a year uh, by 11 and a quarter days. You see how far behind they would be on everything? They would be lost. They would be years behind on their calendar. So what they do is they throw in that 29th day month, that 29 day month every two to three years. But we've discovered something late. Uh, was it last year? I think it was late last year. We discovered something and I shared it with you guys. And I'm going to share it here with you now again. It's very easy to comprehend when you get to the solstices. Now, you need to understand or remember that it's 11 and a quarter days. So you might have a count of 18, but it's 19, or you might have a count of 19, but it's 18 sometimes of days, just as an example, okay? It, it, it might be bang on that date in your count, or it might be a difference of one. And it's the accounting of the quarter days, okay? We're not accounting for every single quarter day over the years. So let me show you what I mean. You see, in 2019, they had one Adar and Adar 2. So in 2019, I went and did this for a 10-year stretch when I shared this last year. So what do they do? They add a 29-day month. This 29-day month, was to catch up from the previous time they added a second Adar. Otherwise, they would end up over years, they would fall behind by years. You get it? Because every year is 11 and a quarter days, 11 and a quarter days, 11 and a quarter days, 11 and a quarter days. You do that for several years and you'll fall back a year behind everybody else, okay? In their counting of their calendar. 
So that's why they do it. But you have to understand when they add it, it's because they're catching up. They're catching up to that time of the moon count that has gone by already. And what we showed, I'm not going to go back 10 years to, to break down the entire detail of it, but what we were able to show and prove was that where you see the 15th of Savan, the 15th of Savan should always land at the summer solstice. The 15th of uh, Kislev should always land on the 21st of the winter solstice. It's always to the solstices. So what we have here is we know by the by them adding this 29th day, like I did it in the in last year, that when they added 29 days, sometimes you're going to see that when they add 29 days, there was only 26 days that ne they needed to account for. But they added 29 because that's where the month is set at. And in other cases, it's like 35 days too much. But they still only add 29. And we can prove the count of this being off in a more accurate way than simply saying, like the Book of Jubilees, 10 days off every year. Because we know it's not 10, we know it's 11 and a quarter. And it's not that they're going to continuously do that year after year after year after year, because what did they do? They added a second Adar every two to three years to help them catch up. But when they do, and the point of this is to show that when they do add a 29 day month, it's always 29 when they do it. When they do it, it's rarely ever exactly 29 days that were missed. It's usually less or it's usually more. Okay? So what do we see? One, two, three. So there was three months, right? Three months from the second Adar. Okay, you had one, two, three, which means... Again, and I'm just giving you the, the basics because I'm not going all the way back to the other ones and doing everything. So we had one, two, three days, which means, you see, there was still four. There was one more, which means when they added this second Adar, there was 30 days of the moon that were adding up and built up. It was approximately 30. Remember, it could be a quarter, uh, maybe a half on this side or the other. Okay, but it was approximately 30 days. So when they added this, they were short one day. And you're, you'll understand what I mean as I bring this forward. So they added this, but they really needed 30. So there was one carried over. <clears throat> but then you have April, right? Nissan. That's one more day because the moon is off by almost one day per month. Okay, it's 11 and a quarter. It's not 12. This is where we're talking about, these quarters and so forth, right? So about one day per month. So it was one day off, and then you had two, one for April, one for May, one for June, okay? They carried one over, plus three more. So how many days was it off? Four days, okay? So there's four days. Five, <clears throat> six, seven, eight, nine. 10. Let's see what this says. Let's go to the 15th of Kislev. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. See that? That was 9. What did we count? 10. But remember that account for the quarter of a day. It could be a quarter on one side or a quarter on the other side, or it could have even built so now that it was maybe 22 and a half days from previous carryovers. Okay? So, this is why I told you in the beginning, sometimes it'll be one day difference, sometimes it'll be exact. It never goes off by two days. It's because of that accounting for that quarter day, but eventually that quarter day adds up to one day, you see? So this got us to what? Nine days. <clears throat> so the full moon is here, but in reality, 
because the moon falls by almost a day per month then that means it was off by 10 uh, nine days right one two three four five six seven eight nine so it's off by nine let's keep going watch this there's nine 10 11 12 oh they never added a second adar 12 13 14 15 okay let's go have a look let's go to the 15th of savan there's one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve thirteen fourteen bang 15. are you following what i'm saying if they don't account for the moon in a year well then you see it continues to add being off it continues to go off course by about a day a month right a little less than a day a month month after month after month after month after month until they add a second adar exactly as it was telling us here in jubilees but it's not 10 it's 11 and a quarter okay it's not 10 it's 11 and a quarter but they do account for it whereas jubilees is saying look they're never going to account for it so all of their years are going to be screwed up all of everything is going to be screwed up forever while their years are not screwed up overall but their feasts as it said you see that what does it say and on this account they will err there it is again to the new moons sabbaths fixed times festivals they are going to err so even though they account for it every two to three years all throughout those years they're still wrong because they have no way to reconcile it every month to every year and so they're off all throughout which means all their new moons their sabbaths their fixed days everything is off because we are told right here we know even scientifically that it is a year uh, 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 11 and a quarter days okay you'll see why i'm sharing you this so we just found out that this brought us to 15 days okay 16 17 18 19 20 21 let's have a look and see right it's either gonna be 20 or 21 i'll bet okay oh there you go 21 kislev december 1st one two all the way to what 21. it's off by 21 days to where the moon should actually be where their calendar should have actually been adjusted to but they don't count for it every month so there's 21 days let's keep going 22 23 they still never added into dark okay 23 24 25 26 26 to 27 let's have a look 15th of savan one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 26 to 27. 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 32, 33. Let's see. Where's the 15th of Kislev? <laughs> Look at how far back it is, you see? This is because they're not accounting for it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four, twenty-five, twenty-six, twenty-seven, twenty-eight, twenty-nine, thirty, thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty-three. Thirty-three days off. Let's go to twenty twenty-two, last year. Thirty-three days off. And then what? Thirty-four. 35 and they added a second adar 
So they were 35 days unaccounted for the moon. Now you're tracking? 35 days unaccounted for for the moon. Hence, Jubilee said 10, or really it's 11 and a quarter, days they would be off every single year. So you had that one carryover, and then you had all of this count that brought us to 35 days off before they added a second Adar. When they added a second Adar, again, it's only 29 days. So they had what? About six days carryover, right? Let's see. This would be six days plus one, two, three. Okay, let's see. So you'd have about eight or nine days. One, okay, there's the 15th of Savan. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. See, remember I told you the quarter, right? You notice, you, you've seen it yourself. Some of them are bang on. Some of them are a difference of one. It's always this quarter day added and so forth on either side. So there's eight days. We'll keep watching. There's eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. So 13 to 14 days. Let's see. One, two, okay. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13 days. 13 days the moon is off because remember they adjusted on this year, but they had carryover. <clears throat> so what's that? 13 days off. Now we go to 2023. And I'm going to remind you again, what did Jubilees tell us? It would be 10 days off every year if they never adjusted. Well, they adjust every two to three years and it's 11 and a quarter. And when they do, there's either overage or there's underage. <laughs> All right. It's either over or it's under. And we just got to 14. All right. Sorry, 13. Okay. We just got to 13 days that they still haven't accounted for. Or that's not accounted for. So 13, 14, 15 days unaccounted for. So what happens? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. Right? Fifteen. Actually, it doesn't have to go to the twenty-first here. That's this twenty-first. When I was counting those other ones, we were talking about the solstice. This isn't a solstice. Okay. So what do we have? We had thirteen days, fourteen for Tibet, fifteen for Shabbat. What is fifteen? There you go, brothers and sisters. I'm talking to you from right here on the 16th of February on the Hebrew calendar, the 25th of Shabbat. <clears throat> Our exciting day that we had been anticipating like crazy was the 15th of Shabbat for the Tuba Shabbat, New Year of Trees, the 70th year to the Lord. We have extra biblical evidence of them going off course by 10 days every single year if they never accounted for it for which we know the truth is it was 11 and a quarter and when they do they will err on their new moons their sabbaths their fixed days their festivals and everything else i just i just showed it to you so what does that mean well when we looked at it like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, why were we excited so much looking for this date yesterday from the 14th into the 15th? Because we live on this side of the world and this is over in Jerusalem. Why were we so excited? We were so excited because we had a piece of, of Apocrypha that told us it would be 10 days too late. That it they would be 10 days off every year. But what we didn't properly account for, what I didn't properly account for, it says comes out early each year by 10 days. Each year by 10 days. For which I just showed you where the moon should be if it had been properly accounted where on their calendar, where the actual 15th day of the month should literally be. 
And it's not just 10 days later or 11 and a quarter days later going into today. Right? Earlier this morning. Because we had to first understand which we did. And why did we? Because we were a part of those who would make observations about the moon. You see? We've made these observations about the moon. So if we tracked everything we were teaching last year <clears throat> in the latter part of the year, it might have even been the year before with the moon. I can't remember now. Something seems so long ago. Something seems so short, right? So why, why can we still be as excited as we were to right here? Because the reality was this date right here didn't actually physically moon equal anything. But you want to know what was really interesting about this? Is a lot of people were sharing, and I think a lot of people still didn't hear about it. Uh, it was shared with us too in the forum. That you see the 24th day. Now remember, Zechariah is a hugely important piece of scripture for us. The entire book of Zechariah. Because within it, Zechariah is to speak in a Judah. And it's the 14 chapters that have a typology of what we call chapters to years. And you will see that within the chapters are events that play out throughout the years, just like Hosea is to the Gentiles or to Israel or quote unquote to the world. And what do we see in Zechariah 1 when it goes on to say, behold, these, whoops, in verse 12, these 70 years, which we believe right now the revelation is these 70 years that we are in. What did it say? It said it was the 24th day of the 11th month, which is the month of Shabbat. So it said 11th month in Shabbat. So on the Hebrew calendar, was it the 24th day of the 11th month, which is Shabbat? Yes. So does this mean, oh, this should move forward? And so I don't know that it should mean that, that it should move forward. Because it's their calendar. It even said Shabbat. We know the Lord God is saying they're going to err, but he's also giving a date on their calendar. And do you want to know why it was shared in the forum? Not because we've never seen this before. But because if you go to the New Living Translation, and I do not recommend anybody read and switch to go to the New Living Translation. It is the, the revelation of the Lord and the mysteries. Everything is the King James Version. There's a reason it's the bestseller because it is the Lord's will. But you're going to see something very interesting in the New Living Translation of Zechariah 1.7. And I didn't bring it up, but if you go look it up, instead of the 24th day of the 11th month, which is Shabbat, it gives you, it translated the Gregorian date from, I think, 519 BC, and it said February 15th. Well, that's pretty insane because only this year, yesterday, was the 24th day of Shabbat, the 11th month, the 15th of February. Now, it may not seem like a big deal because you could say, oh, well, that would just equal it pretty much every year, right? Nope. I went back and checked from 2010 all the way to 2037. And in only one year, 2023, does the 24th day of the 11th month, which is Shabbat, equal February 14th. That was another reason we couldn't just toss something aside and say oh well you know these other things look good no it kept building and building and building so it seemed very 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 significant yet still nothing happened but what does it tell us it tells us that this red horse along with other horses that are red uh red horses speckled in white that they gave a report to the Lord, right? Or to, to the angel of the Lord. 
and said, you know, that stood under, uh, stood among the myrtle trees, answered and said, these are they whom the Lord hath sent to walk to and fro through the earth. Okay, so what we can look at this as is there's now been a report. We have a literal date that equaled a biblical date that happened on the same day. And we know that it's the 70th year, these 70 years. So is it possible that whoever these horsemen were walking to and fro through the earth have just given their report to the Lord? They went walking to and fro through the earth and they've given their report. That's pretty wild. I think that's incredibly wild. Listen what it says. Let's keep going to verse 11. And they answered, the angel of the Lord. See, they answered because there was more than one horse. And uh, the angel of the Lord that stood among the myrtle trees and says, we had walked to and fro through the earth and behold, the earth is still and is at rest. Verse 12. Then the angel of the Lord answered and said, O Lord of hosts. So now the angel of the Lord is talking to the Lord of hosts. How long will you not have mercy on Jerusalem and on the cities of Judah against which thou hast had indignation these 70 years? You see, once you understand Zechariah's prophecy throughout, remember uh, Ecclesiastes, I think it's 12, 8 or 12, 9. What was shall be, and what is shall be. Old Testament will be tied into prophecy. New Testament from Christ until the moment of the escape will be tied into prophecy. Both was and is will be connected to the is to come. And that's what we see here in the open books that we have. For example, we've got many more than Zechariah and Hosea, but Zechariah and Hosea, for example, just as we have shared the the gospels and who they're speaking to and the discourses once you understand who the gospels are speaking to and the revelation of the 14 years and that small 40 50 days above it both was and is shall be zachariah's 14 chapters begins with these 70 years what we don't yet understand with the lord is where is he accounting this all from? What is the, the specific time that this 70 years ends? Because I'll tell you what, I can guarantee you right now, if we knew when, <laughs> we would know when, right? We would know when the 50 days will begin in the escape of the bride if we knew the precise mystery of when the Lord began the 70 year count. But guess what? There's not much time left. There's not much time left. You see, what's what's another one of the things that we know about the beginning? Right? What was the beginning? Taurus. Christ. Right? Their alphabet, the beginning. It was Christ. It was the beginning. It was Taurus. It's, it's the whole image. This is the beginning, Aleph. This represents the head of Taurus, and this means the beginning, Taurus, Aleph. This is the eye on the right side when you look up. This is the eye on the left side. This one means 70. This one means 50, and it's the 14th brightest. So we know it's Taurus. So the question is, which kind of Taurus? <laughs> You're thinking, what are you talking about? What kind of Taurus are we looking at? Well, are we looking at Taurus from a John 4 perspective? When Jesus said, four months, it's already ready. The fields are white, which again is the new year of trees, which is wages for the reapers to gather fruit, which is the fruit trees. The fruit bearing trees, which is Samaritan, which means watch, which is related to the almond, which is related to 70, which is related to the well. Are we looking really, is it this? Because what's four months early? 
One, two, three, right? Oops, sorry. Can't count from February. <laughs> That's the beginning. You see people do that all the time. I catch myself sometimes. It starts here, okay? One, complete. Two, complete. Three, complete. Four, complete. Four complete months to what? The 15th of Savan, the true Feast of Weeks. Okay, now this wouldn't really be the true Feast of Weeks, would it? It would be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. By the time you get here, it would be 18 days off. This is the real Feast of Weeks or 15th day of Savan, even though it says Tammuz. Remember, they're off. Okay, this is all a revelation of what Jubilees was telling us. So knowing it's got to account for these additional moons, what would the difference be to four months? Where the moon should be. Brothers and sisters, what I'm sharing, I believe, could very well be as exciting as this was here. And the reason is because this is not Tuba Shavat. This is Tuba Shabbat. The answer is given to us in the book of Jubilees, for which we have observed the difference in the moon's movement, and we were able to prove it. So what did we get? 15 days? Let me bring it all the way into 2024 just to help new people see how perfect this is. Okay, so that was 15, 16. Oh, they didn't add a second Adar. So there's 16, 17, 18, 19. So what was it, right? 18, 19, let's see. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. Bang, 18, all right? 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24. Let's see. Let's go to Kislev. 1, 2, 3. Remember, we're starting always at the 15th. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24. Remember, 24, 25. There it is, 24. Watch this, 24, 25, 26. Oh, they added a second Adar. So it was only 26 days before they added a second Adar. And what did they add? 29 days. Well, now they've got three days too many. So if they got three days too many, then you got to take one off of April, right? Nissan. You got to take one off May, one off June. So that means by the time you get to June 2024, if they were three days too many and you had April, May, June, then you just made up those three days, which means in June of 2024, the 15th day of Savan should land on June 21st. Let's prove it. Bang. June 21st, 15th day of Savan. You see that? This is the evidence of the moon. This is the understanding and the revelation of the moon being off course, as Jubilees has been telling us. I don't know why I got excited in the events that were connected to the 15th 
of February, the 24th of Shabbat, right? The, the comet going near the eye of the bull. But the reality of how much the moon is off by is 15 days. Which means the 15th of Shabbat, Tuba Shabbat, is truly, and I mean truly, the 20th of February. Am I saying get so fired up you can't sleep? That's up to you. <laughs> I'm, I'm still taking it with a grain of salt. Because you see what this does, right? What we were looking at here, what we were looking at here, in reality, when we account for the moon, it's literally here. So we, it's okay to be as excited as you were here and as excited as you were coming into here. But take it with a grain of salt. This is no thus saith the Lord. This is through revelation over five and a half years. You see, it's a little here, it's some here, it's some there. But it begins with the revelation of the Gospels, followed by the revelation of the years of tribulation. Understanding that 70 completed is the end of this time that we're in and the 14 years will begin. But prior to it, there's 50 days. So what does this do for us, brothers and sisters? It means everything we were looking at connected to here and everything we were looking at connected to here, thinking it was the same because of the 10 days, it's here. Right? It's here. And then what do you have? March, April. So then what happens to Nissan? Well, the 15th of Nissan isn't really there. It would be off by what? Was it 15, 16, 17 days? So if there'd be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. The 15th of Nisan would really be over here. Which means the first of Nisan is guess what? Or the year's end, right? Nisan, right? Adar 29 to Nisan 1 in reality is right here. Isn't that interesting? Because the Jews think right? Or, or the church, right? First fruits, resurrection day. This would be what would we, we would call the year's end when Syria comes and brings destruction. Didn't the Lord say, I would cause your, your, your feasts, call, uh, your feast to turn to mourning at the time of their first fruits? This isn't the time of the escape. This is the year's end. Right? This is the year's end. And what does it leave? It leaves one, two, three days. This is the 50th day. I think it's, it's right in here equals the 50th day. Remember what we said. So what we'd be looking at is Tuba Shavat, right? There's day one, two, three, four, five, six, Seven, and the Lord returns on the eighth day to start his 40 days. So the escape could, could be, could be the 19th on our side of the world into the 20th, the pre-trib escape. The seven-day wedding in heaven would take place. The Lord returns on the eighth day. When he returns on the eighth day, you guys know the whole story. He has a banquet with the disciples. Remember, what does he start with? He's going to anoint. He's going to anoint in here the apostles first. There's going to be the escape, 
and he's going to anoint a group of apostles which is still perfectly fitting because this whole conversation of the Kansas City Chiefs winning. We knew they were going to win. It was prophetic, and I believe, Bob Jones, I've seen other people that were in his presence that told of these things that he told them. There's some great ones, actually. It's pretty wild. Okay? We shared it in the last video, a little bit of a conversation about him. We've talked about him uh, uh, quite a bit in the past as well, or a little bit in the past as well. It doesn't mean when the Kansas City Chiefs won that, oh, it, it had to be immediate. But what do we know? We know that when the Kansas City Chiefs win, there would be shortly after the apostolic age of revival would begin, right? We know, we know the meaning of the apostolic age beginning. We know the 50 days at the escape, the Lord will symbolically in the same typology like John chapter 20, when he breathed on the apostles and left for seven and came back on the eighth day. That is what would take place while the wedding is going on in heaven. And the disciples who are chosen to remain and will work are waiting, being girded about, waiting for the knock on the door from the Lord when he comes to start his 40 days. So let's just count it out. One. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four, twenty-five, twenty-six, twenty-seven, twenty-eight, twenty-nine, thirty, thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty-three, thirty-four, thirty-five, thirty-six, thirty-seven, thirty-eight, thirty-nine, forty. See that? Where does the Lord's forty days end? At the year's end. At the year's end, where true Nissan should be. Where the true beginning of Nissan should be. Isn't that wild? Because if you remember what happens, he warns for 40 days and lets Jerusalem know. He might be warning around the world as well, but with his signs and his wonders that he's going to be doing, the world's going to think he's Antichrist except for those that are following him and recognize him, those who, who have been, in, who have been um, part of the, the revival that starts when the apostles start doing their work. When the Lord comes for his 40 days, he's doing the Luke 21 discourse. He's warning them. Remember, some of the disciples that are going to be following Jesus are going to be dying during these 40 days. They're going to be taken prisoner and captive. And some shall be put to death. And when these 40 days are over, what do we know takes place? Well, the compassing about that happened, right? One, two, three. That's the end of 50. The anointing of the Holy Ghost and the attack by Syria. It starts with a compassing about, right? The compassing about starts at the time of the year's end. So this, this in what we're looking at is the exact same count of everything we were doing to the 15th of Shavat on the Hebrew calendar. We're not changing anything of that revelation except what we're saying is we're accounting for the true difference of the moon and why was i saying taurus we know the revelation and the understanding of taurus we know it and so if john again if john chapter 4 is really truly to be understood for this group at the beginning this luke group white in the fields looking up ready to go then four months early is what? One, two, three, four. Taurus. Savannah. You see what I'm saying? But what if this time comes and goes? 
what if this time comes and goes well i could tell you this we're still in the 70th year and i think this was a much bigger sign than anybody understands or that anybody has understood that february 15th was the 24th day of shabbat that that the 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 chiefs won at a time we know is the 70th year is when these two lined up which means it's somewhere around here now here's the other piece of the puzzle and here's the other the other question if it turns out that it's not to the 19th 20th of january depending where you live in the earth if it's not there then what would i be looking for next well, the answer has never changed. It's Taurus. You see, remember I told you there was going to be two variations to Taurus. Either John 4 was for us, and it's going to be four months early, which is from Taurus. Or it's actually going to be where Taurus is. Okay? So what's happening here now? Well, when we accounted for this moon difference that gave us the 15 days what were we accounting for we were counting just the moon weren't we we weren't accounting for the sun but we know the sun is off by two months there's there's a there's something really interesting to that because we know the sun is off by two months right It's 364, but really 365 and a quarter. We know the sun is off by two months. We've proven it. We know that Nissan isn't supposed to be really Nissan in March, April. It's really supposed to be May, June with Savan. However, the harvests of springtime don't wait until savan why well because the sun has literally moved two constellations over okay it it literally is the time of abib in the month of give or take in april so my point is should we be accounting for the sun and pushing everything back also two months in this scenario i am not and i don't believe we should because a beeb whether they think whether they have it for here or whether the truth like i said is uh where was it wherever it was to to um nissan right there was the beginning of nissan that's right this brought us to uh the 15th of savant of nissan and this was around here was the first of nissan okay so what doesn't change well because the sun has literally moved two months over thousands of years i'm not so sure that we need to account for those two months because a beeb is still a beeb by april ish sometime in april if you wait for a beeb all the way to june <laughs> your harvest is going to be way past due all right in relation to barley we're not talking wheat okay it would be way past due. So I'm not so sure that we necessarily have to. Okay? Remember this in in uh, Deuteronomy. So when we were saying this in Exodus 12, when, when the Lord told Moses and Aaron this, that this is the, the beginning of their months and their days of the year, it was truly Taurus. And the moon was accounted to where it should be. The Lord knew what he was telling them. When we come to Deuteronomy chapter 16, 
we see that Passover, right, is the month of Abib. And we've taught on this that the original 14thers, those that were representative of Smyrna, of the church of Smyrna, in the is after Christ, they stood on what they learned through the disciples of the apostles and what Polycarp, who was the bishop of Smyrna, knew who had learned from the apostle John. Polycarp himself literally learned from John, <clears throat> and he stood up as a 14th-er, as the bishop of Smyrna, and stood on the truth that the 14th day of the first month is true Passover. Well, how did they account for it? The history tells us that they accounted for it by barley abib. They accounted for it by barley being abib. So if it's accounted for by barley being abib, there's no way you're going to wait till June for your barley to be abib. It's just silliness. So you see why? Because, because, sorry, babe. My wife's uh, in Vancouver with the family, and uh, she's just calling. Hi, honey. Love you. Call you later. So you, you could see what I'm saying, because in the book of Jubilees, it doesn't tell us that the sun is the thing that's going to throw them off. Just that it's the moon. This is what really had me going down this trail. When I said, hold on a second. I know we've understood the moon and we've understood the sun, but I thought, wait a second, I, I never accounted for this silly moon thing yet. I hadn't accounted for where the moon should actually be in relation to what we have already studied and how far it's off. But should we account also for the sun being off two months? That's the question. Is John chapter 4 really going to be related to us? If it is, then get ready because the moon difference is the 20th of February in these 70 years. If the moon does need to be accounted for, well then, what does that make Savant? Well, how many days was Savan off, right? <clears throat> Excuse me. We had 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. It came out to what? I think it was 18 days difference, right? So Savan 1 wouldn't be till about right here. This would have to be sometime in the year's end, right? Remember, what does that do? This is the 15th, okay? So there we go. Just like I said, it was 18 days off. That f 15 days later, the 21st of June would be true 15th of Savan. So if this is the beginning, I don't want to mess you guys up. This, if we account for the moon and we account for the sun being two months off, then Nisan 1 isn't really in here to the Lord God, or month 1 isn't really here. Month 1 is really around here, which makes this the end of the year. And from this, we would go what? 50 days back, which would put us sometime in April. So I'm not going to go into much detail in that because all that does, just all I did was I continued the count from the moon 15 days and I said 16 days, 17 days, 18 days, 19. Remember, it was 18, 19 and it worked out to 18. So this would actually be the beginning of Sivan. This would actually be the 15th of Sivan because they haven't accounted for the moon. 
okay when you account for it this is where the numbers of these months should be as the beginning of Sivan and the 15th of Sivan. And if Taurus is the beginning, then this, with the account of the sun, would be the end and the beginning of the year. You follow what I'm saying? See? Just like we can go into into here, see? Goes to February, to March, there you go. There begins March. Here's April. There's all of April. May and May into June, okay? February, March, March into April, April into May, May into June, right? Part of one month, part of the other in our Gregorian. And it brings us to what? Taurus. So the question is, is it going to be when the sun is in Taurus? I'm going to close this now. Is it going to be when the sun is in Taurus? Or is it going to be according to simply what Jubilees told us? For the very reason that if we accounted for two months, the Abib barley would be rotten if they waited till Savant. I hope I'm really driving it home and you guys are really grasping this. Because I don't really believe that it could be pushed two months and still have the, the determined understanding of the harvest. But we were given Taurus. We were given Taurus. And if the accounting for the two months is something that can't really be pushed because Abib barley is truly a bee barley in April, and it would be rotten if you waited till June, then that means the true beginning of Nissan being April 7th is the, is, is the start of the year, is the year's end beginning of the year. You see, how could we push it two months in relation to saying now this is Nissan one or the first month? Was it according to Exodus 12? Yes. Was it according to creation and Christ being called the beginning? Yes. But the reality of two months off is the difference from Abib. The original guys knew that it was Abib from the Apostle John. And Polycarp, the Bishop of Smyrna, was no slouch. He knew what he was talking about. He met with John and learned from John the Apostle. Uh, yeah, from John the Apostle. And he was a 14er. So I can't just dismiss that. 14ers to 14ers. How could I just dismiss and say, well, regardless of a B, it's just two months off? Because we have supporting evidence that this says they're going to err because of the moon, not because of the sun. Is the sun in air? Yes. The sun has gone off two months, and we know that when the Lord comes, the sun and the moon will be ashamed according to the last verse or two of Isaiah 24. We know who the sun and the moon in their fallen state represent as, as Rome and as the Arabs. We know it. We've taught on these things. But it doesn't change where the actual harvest times are ready. 
But the reason I am sharing it with you is so that we're not distraught and completely at a loss if the 20th of February comes and goes. Because we still have what we were shared, which is Taurus. And Taurus is Savan. And corrected Savan with the moon from the 1st to the 15th is here. So this could be the year's end and the beginning of the year. Which would put 50 days earlier somewhere in the second half of April. We'll look into those details more if need be. But I believe for right now, this is the revelation that we could take from the book of Jubilees, understood by the observations of the moon, which we have already understood. So I hope that helps. I hope I was slow enough in it and being able to, to help you see it and to understand it. All right? So hold on tight, brothers and sisters. I believe we are still in this. And that by in this, I mean still very close. All right? And now what we're going to do is we're going to spend a little time in the Gospels with some more beautiful connections that bring us, well, to, to a scary connection that a lot of people don't like to talk about, but you're gonna see it proved out again. And it's pretty wild, all right? Um, let me see, where was I? I think it's Luke chapter 20, yeah. So this is the story. Let's go into Luke chapter 20, further up back in nine, okay? What we see, I want to see this order, actually. Okay. Remember, this is, this is a good thing to bring up right now. We were talking about um, in relation to the book of Jubilees and that they did err, right? That the Gentiles erred, which is the Mark group, and that Judah errs in their calendars. Okay, that's the Matthew group. We talked about how it said that they erred. And in the last video... We were also sharing about where they err in in uh, Mark's um, portion of the woman that was married seven times. She had seven husbands. One died after the other, married another, died, married another. In heaven, whose husband is going to be hers, right? Which one will be hers? In the story, in Luke, there's no berating. When you go to the story of Mark, he says, you do err not knowing the scriptures. When you go to Matthew, you do err not knowing the scriptures. And we shared the connection in the last video, how Jubilees is telling us the exact same thing. But in Luke, there is no berating. It talks about the accounted worthy. And we showed how the difference in the accounted worthy, that the accounted worthy are those that would go pre-trib. The accounted worthy are those who will not see any of these other things that will happen. They will escape all these things that shall come to pass. That's the pre-trip. That's what we're talking about happening in the 19th to the 20th, depending where you live on earth, as that possibility. But then there's an, another group with the comma and those that are part of the resurrection of the dead, which are the disciple workers that we were talking about earlier and that we talked about <coughs> in the previous video that we were that I was just saying in relation to the calendar that if this is the escape this is the lord returning as the son of man for his 40 days this is the eighth day this is those disciples at this point that he will meet with he will serve and he will sup with them that would be this date right here all right on the eighth day that's the difference between the two groups you do not see this conversation in Mark or in Matthew. Now, when you come up, oops, give me a second here. When we go up further in Luke 20, we see the parable of the wicked tenants. I'm going to show you some of these differences, but in particular, 
I'm going to show you the, the focus of Matthews and the major difference in Matthews. It's incredible. But I'll show you other ones along the way as well. This is just a really good study giving us more evidence, more prophecy, more clues built into the Gospels and the differences of their stories all throughout. Because it is clearly contradictions all throughout the story of the wicked tenants when you read them from Luke, Mark, and Matthew's differences. But when you understand the differences in the Gospels and you spent time and you diligently seek it out with the Lord, you're going to see it. It's beautiful. Listen to what it says. Uh, starting in Luke 9, it says, Then began he to speak to the people this parable. A certain man planted a vineyard. So what did he do here? Just planted a vineyard. And led it forth to the husbandman. Okay? So the, the, the owner planted a vineyard and he put it out to the husbandman, right? Those who were oversee it all while he's gone. What happened? And went to a far country for a long time. You're only going to find this in Luke's. Okay? He went on a long journey and then he comes back. Right? This is very interesting because if you remember, I think it's in... Uh, I know where it is. I know where it is. Where are you? Where are you? Where are you? Oh, Proverbs. Proverbs 7 or Proverbs 8? And Proverbs 7. So Proverbs 7, verse 19 and 20. For the good man is not at home. He is gone on a long journey. He hath taken a bag of money with him and will come home at the day appointed. Fullness, right? The full moon. Why is this important? Well, guess what? This is the full moon, right? But we know how much it's gone off course because this should actually be the time of the full moon. How fitting, right? At this full moon, what should it be? The festival of the Lord. What is this new year of trees to the Lord? And why has it been something that we've been so adamant about? Because it equals a celebration of thanksgiving for harvest. The only way this could be possible is if it was four months early. And it came from what? The Hebrew word 1984, which is what? To be clear, to shine, sound like the white from Luke's group. The white robe, the gorgeous robe. And it means what? Given marriage. So, of course, we're excited for this, right? Of course, it's making sense. But the connection is to the full moon. But the moon's there. It is, but it's not supposed to be. It's supposed to be there. Which means Tuba Shabbat isn't there. It's really here. And I want, let me, let me help you guys sink this in. Do you know that the Jews are aware of it? The Jews know. They 100% know. How can we know that they know? How do we know that they know? <laughs> right, that whole story. How can we know that they know? Because they add a month every two to three years to make up for it. So we know that they know. <laughs> if they didn't, they would never add it a month. And they're not adding it in advance. They're adding it to catch up. So we know that they know that they're actually off. Yet there's never any mention for it. They never account for it. This is the fact. The only difference is, is this fact the one connected to John chapter 4? We're about to find out. We're about to find out, brothers and sisters. And the more I share on it, the more I bring understanding, the more excited I get. <laughs> so, buckle up. <laughs> so, now listen to this, okay? All he did was he planted a vineyard and he set it forth to us, his husbandman and he went uh, into a far country for a long time. We saw the connection to that. It's connected to the moon. And it just so happens it was in Proverbs chapter 7. Right? Because we're in what? In reality, 
we believe we're somewhere at the tail end of this first seven easy years, like I was telling you guys at the beginning. Seven easy, seven of seals, seven of trumpets. It's like the story of Jacob. He worked seven years, then got Leah, then ended up getting Rachel after the one-week wedding, but had to work seven more years before it was official. And then he worked six years for the cattle, which brings it to the end of 20 years. At the end of 20 years, he made a covenant. What happens when the Lord comes at the end of the 20 or at the end of 13? He renews the covenant that he made at the end of seals, at the beginning of trumpets, and destroys the enemy, right? Renews everything. It's awesome. So I do absolutely fully believe we're at the tail end of this seven. And when this tail end, that 50 days starts, we know that 50 days from there, is the Lord's end of 70 years. It's over, that 47 to 50th day. You see, the Luke group represents the spirit, the Mark group represents the light, and the Matthew group is the flesh. It's exciting stuff, guys. Okay, we see that uh, he sent his servant out, <clears throat> right, for the husbandman, um, that they should give him of the fruit of the vineyard. But the husbandman beat him and sent him away empty. Now listen to this. They, he sends another servant. They entreated him shamefully and sent him away also. Then again, he sent the third. <clears throat> right? He sent the third. So one servant, two servant, three servants. And he wounded him and cast him out. Then he talks about sending his son. Oh, should I send my son? They see the heir that they should kill him. Right? They can take his inheritance. And they kill him and listen to what it says. Uh, so they cast him out of the vineyard and killed him. What therefore shall the Lord of the vineyard do unto them? He shall come and destroy these husbandmen and they shall give the, and shall give the vineyard to others. And when they heard it, they said, God forbid. Now listen to this, Luke 20, 17. And he beheld them and said, what is this then that is written? The stone which the builders rejected is become the head of the corner. Interesting, right? That also lines up, by the way, with our chapters to years. Right? With our chapters to years of Psalms. So, do you see any berating here? No. Yet again, just like we showed in this story, there was no berating to the Luke group in this conversation and when the story starts he only talks about having planted a vineyard and having gone to a far country for a long time this is a typology of the lord having planted the seed with his death and resurrection and the church age beginning the time of christ coming the salvation of christ beginning and then it says he sent one servant two servants and a third servant and each of them they cast out empty, gave them a little bit of a beat down or a shaming, and they were gone. Only the vineyard and gone for a long time. When we go to Mark's story, it's interesting that you see the triumphal entry there first too. Uh, is it 11 or is it in 12? I think it's in 12. So there's the parable of the tenants in Mark's story. <clears throat> oh man, you're going to get a kick out of this one. Listen to this. Mark 12, verse 1. And he began to speak unto them by parables. A certain man planted a vineyard and set a hedge about it and digged a place for the wine fat. Okay? Not the wine press, the wine fat. Okay? It's only used one time. Okay? Only one time and built a tower and let it out to the husbandmen and went to a far country, not for a long time and not only a vineyard. Remember, we're in Mark's group here. Wait till we get to Matthew and you see what's in Matthew and how it ties them all together. And then it says, and at the season, he sent to the husbandmen a servant that he might receive from him the husbandmen of the fruit of the vineyard. And they caught him and beat him 
and sent him away empty listen to this and again he sent unto them another servant listen carefully and him they cast stones and listen to this and wounded him in the head and sent him away shamefully handled <coughs> what isn't that wild you only find this in luke's by the way uh, sorry in mark's by the way a wound on the head remember what i said about the discourses remember what i said about the gospels if you're new luke's group is pre-trib mark's group is seals which is the false prophet and antichrist at the end of the six years of seals we know the lord is returning antichrist is going to be killed right the lord is here on mount zion during the first half of trumpets satan is cast down at mid trumpets the pit is open antichrist is also returned okay this is the matthew portion what happens when jesus is cut off we know there's this again that's going to take place but what happens during mark's portion what what takes place in mark's portion of seals how about uh we go to revelation chapter 13 which is about two and a half years or so into seals and what do we read let's go let's go revelation 13 3. and i saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death and his deadly wound was healed and all the world wondered after the beast hello do you think that's just coincidence do you think it's just oh happenstance that the term you strike in the head is used once in relation to this story in Mark's gospel? Just by chance. Do you understand? Yes, the Antichrist is the enemy. He's an enemy. But what is the Lord doing? It's the Lord's will. It's the Lord's will that the Antichrist be there. Why? because the tribulation will bring about the greatest revival in human history that ever was or ever will be hundreds of millions of people during seals will come to christ i don't know if a couple hundred million or so or more will die the majority will live but i believe there's going to be approximately 1.2 billion and change people saved during seals how did the lord bring that about by making it the scariest time in human history to this point and who's responsible for it antichrist right antichrist is yes the lord allowed it but it's the lord releasing the spirit of antichrist allowing it to take place you see so it's no wonder why the the wounded him in the head is only found in marks like we saw the other only found in luke and then it says and again he sent another so just like luke's it's he sent one he sent two he sent three okay uh and sent another and him kill and him they killed and many others beating some and killing some so now in this case this third one bang this guy they killed and then you get the story of his son okay and then should he send his son fellow heir let us uh uh uh, uh, this is the heir come let us kill him and the inheritance shall be ours and they took him and killed him and cast him out of the vineyard what therefore shall the lord of the vineyard do will he come and destroy the husbandman and give the vineyard to others look at what he says now in mark and have you not read and have you not read this scripture the stone which the builders rejected 
is become the head of the corner. This was the Lord's doing. And it is marvelous in our eyes. You see, it's the Lord's doing. But Mark is being berated again for their lack of reading and having understood the scriptures. Just so happens. Oh, was it in the same one? It just so happens that that story is the same kind we see with the married, with the woman and the seven husbands. And look at what it says. Right? And touching the dead that they rise, have you not read in the book of Moses? Ye therefore do greatly err. What's that, three or four times just in two stories? In Mark, you have the the connection to the Antichrist and the head wound. You have the connection to uh, 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 berating because they haven't read the scriptures. They just go to church. Oh, they believe in the Lord. They'll be ready for, they're going to be ready for, for paradise, right? For anybody that's new, the first group goes to the third heaven. The pre trib group is going to the third heaven. The mid-trib group in the seventh year of seals, they're going to paradise. It's still a good deal, right? (laughs) It is, but only if you plan on willfully not seeking and being diligent with the Lord and would rather wait through seals. Right? I'd rather be ready and in the Lord and diligently seeking and loving and repentant and maybe be chosen to work during seals. That's okay. You'll have power, you'll have authority, and you will have the understanding. Nobody will need to teach the workers. They will all know. Okay? But it was the Lord's doing. So now, what if we go to Matthews? Check out Matthews. This is where it started for me. This is where it started when I went to Matthews. Check this out. And the reason it starts in 33... The reason for me was a specific word. You'll understand why in a minute. In Matthew's version, Matthew 21, 33, here another parable. There was a certain householder which planted a vineyard and hedged it about and digged a wine press. You're going to notice this wine press is used five times. But what you're about to find out is you can almost say it's really just one time. Because out of all of the Gospels, it's only used one time, and you got it. It's right here in Matthew. The rest is the book of Revelation. So where is Matthew talking about? Matthew's portion is trumpets. When is the wine press? At the end of 20 or at the end of the 13th year of seals, When the Lord returns, feet down, and brings destruction against all the enemies, Satan is bound. Okay? It's going to be what? At the end of the 20, right? Or end of 13 slash start of 21 or start of 14, right? It's like this line in between. It's the beginning of it. Okay? And you'll see where this is all leading to with the wine press. So wine press in it and built a tower and let out let it out to a husbandman and went to a far country you see again more description and not for a long time because the typology in the story of of its typology in the end of days understanding he's not going for a long time just like mark he didn't go for a long time he's just gone after his 40 days he'll come back after six years of seals in that seventh year And then he'll be here for part of trumpets. Then he's gone even less. And then he'll return feet down at the end of trumpets. So there's no long time except for Luke's portion because it's been almost 2,000 years. Now listen to what it says. Matthew 21, verse 34. Listen carefully. And when the time of the fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the husbandmen, that they might receive the fruits of it. And the husbandman took his 
servants and beat one and killed another and stone another huh again he sent other servants more than the first huh so you have servants as a representation of luke's group the disciple group that are there during the 40 days and then work during seals and then what do you have again he sent other servants plural remember in mark and in luke they weren't plural And what about this again? He sent other servants. And what does it say? More than the first. What is this a typology of? The trumpet workers, right? The 144,000. You had a smaller group as we've been teaching forever. The smaller group goes out first. The disciples from from the Luke bride group, the remnant bride that works. And then... You have the larger group, more than the first, that represent the 144,000. Look at verse 37. But last of all. Well, you see what happened? In, In Luke's, there were three and then the son. In Mark's, there were three and then the son. In Matthew's, we have the story of the Luke remnant bride workers with the 40 days of the Son of Man and their during seals. Then you've got a larger group which represents those from a mark group that are working during trumpets represented as the 144,000. And then look what you get. But last of all, he sent unto them his son saying, they will reverence my son. But when the husbandmen saw the son, they said among themselves, this is the heir, come let us kill him and let us seize on his inheritance. And they caught him and cast him out of the vineyard and slew him. Sounds like the again, right? Let me show you it. When the Lord, therefore, when the Lord, therefore, of the vineyard cometh, what will he do unto those husbandmen? They say unto him, he will miserably destroy those wicked men. Completely different, right? He will wickedly he will destroy those wicked men and will let out his vineyard unto other husbandmen which shall render him the fruits in their season jesus saith unto them did you never read in the scriptures hello (laughs) there it is again and if you go to the woman and the seven husband in matthews he tells them the same thing Again, the head of the corner, right? Therefore, I say unto them, uh, I say unto them, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation that bringeth forth fruits thereof. You see, it has the kingdom of God being spoken of in Matthew, but it's telling them theirs is no longer the kingdom of God. Theirs is what, brothers and sisters? We know theirs is the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of heaven on earth, their millennial reign. The kingdom of God is given to the Luke and the Mark group because the third heaven and paradise, which is a part of it, are the kingdom of God. The kingdom of heaven is the millennial reign, their promise on the earth. And whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken, but on whosoever it shall fall, it will grind them to powder. You see, very strong way to end it in Matthew. Now, what got me to here? How did this all come about? Remember I was telling you the wine press? This word for wine press is only used five times. The five times it's used is in four places. Out of all the Gospels, out of all the rest of the New Testament, it's nowhere but in the book of Revelation. What do we know about where it's found in the book of Revelation? Well, it just so happens we've taught on every single one of these places where it's found in the book of Revelation. Right? Watch this. We know in Revelation 19. Okay, let's go to Revelation 19, verse 15. And you're going to notice something. You're going to see 
It's Revelation chapter 19. Revelation 19. That then leads into what? 20. When he comes at the end of 20 years, feet down on the Mount of Olives, and destroys Satan and binds him into the bottomless pit. Okay? So you got 19, and you have the story of the wine press when he comes to what? Right? In righteousness, he does judge and make war. What war is this, brothers and sisters? You already know it. It's the war that he will bring at the end of the 13 years, at the start of the 14 years, which is exactly what we read in Zechariah 14. Okay? And as we see it, we keep going down. We come to verse 14, uh, Revelation 14, uh, 19, 14. And the armies which are in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Verse 15. And out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, <coughs> that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress, there it is, and he treadeth the winepress with the fierceness and the wrath of Almighty God. And what is he now? King of kings and Lord of lords, all upper case. This is the end of the 19th slash 20th year time frame when the Lord returns feet down and will destroy the enemy, which is why you suddenly see it <coughs> in a typology here at the end of 20. This is a typology at the end of the 20th year when Satan is bound for a thousand years and then you have the resurrection of the dead those who died for Christ, not taking the mark and everything else, part of the first resurrection will not be hurt by the second. This is the church of Smyrna who will rule and reign. His, his, his worker bride, his remnant bride, who will be resurrected to rule and reign with him. Okay? To reign with him as priests. Okay? What do we see? 19 in to 20. Well, where else do we see this? We also see it in chapter 14. Let's go to Revelation chapter 14. Huh. This was in chapter 19, which leads us into 20 in the binding of Satan, which is like the end of what? Which is like the end of 19 and into 20 or the end of that 13th year. He comes and destroys him and binds Satan. What happens if we go into... Uh, where am I? What happens if we go now into Revelation 14? You guys will remember, I taught on this a long time ago. This here is about the 144,000 on Mount Zion as the seventh year of seals to the beginning of trumpets. The 144,000 are sealed. They're there with the Lord. They're about to be sent out. And then it goes into another story. Then it gives us an overview of the tribulation and the times of the, of the judgment and the escapes that are connected to it. Look at verse 7. Okay? 7 to 8, which is like what? It's like looking at 7 to 8. Okay? The escape connected to then destruction coming at the beginning of the 14 years. Listen to what it says. <coughs> uh, Revelation uh, 14, verse 7. Saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. Okay? Judgment is now coming. The bride is gone. Here comes the judgment. How does it start? And there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city. It goes on to say what? Starts talking about if any man will worship the beast, okay? Or take his mark. Here you come to verse 10, which is when it's going to start. The same shall drink 
of the wrath of God, which shall be poured out without mixture. So everybody who takes the mark, okay? It says, if any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand. So you can worship the beast or his image. And you see there's a comma and, which means it's either or, even if you don't take the mark, but you're worshiping the beast in his image, you're done as well. Or receive the mark on, which means, uh, sorry, in, which means on, okay, which means on his forehead or in his hand, okay? Well, what happens during these years from 8, 9, 10? The mark of the beast is coming. You see? This is the time that the mark of the beast is coming. At 10, <laughs> the mark of the beast will be applied. He'll get his power to continue for 42 months and it will begin. And then you see that there in 10, their wrath that's coming upon them. <coughs> Excuse me. Verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. So it's like you've got a verse to years. You see, we've done chapters to years, but it's like you have a verse to years after that story that separates from the 144,000. So what would verse 12 be? Well, look at that. This is now in the midst of the time of the mark of the beast and the Antichrist attacking, <clears throat> beheadings and chaos breaking out. And what does it say? Here is the patience of the saints. And here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. What happens when you're in tribulation in Revelation 13, about midway into seals, and what does it say? Uh, where is it? Where is it? When it says, and here is the patience of, oh, right here. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to over come them and power was given him over all kindred and tongues right verse 10 revelation 13 verse 10 here is the patience and faith of the saints do you think that's just coincidence right in the year timing in in the year to to verse connection to the timing of when all this chaos and beheading and the mark and, and fleeing and everything else has taken place, you have this same wording. Then it says, verse 13, what would be 13? <clears throat> the sixth year of seals. So it could be related even to the sixth year of seals, the end of the sixth year of seals. And it says, and I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, right, blessed are the, right, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Uh, yea, saith the spirit that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. And then what do you get? 14. Harvesting of the earth. What do you have? Seventh year of seals. In the big picture, it's the 14th. And what is it? And I looked and beheld a white cloud. And upon the cloud, one sat like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown and in his hand a sharp sickle. He's going to harvest, okay? Then you can go 17, 18. <clears throat> Look at what it talks about, 18. Gather the clusters of the vine of the earth for the grapes are full ripe. Go to verse 18 to year 18 and it's in the midst of trumpets. And what is trumpets? It is all about the grape harvest. You see 19, gather the vine of the earth Cast it into the great, here it is, wine press. There's that word that is only used once in Matthew. And look at this. It's in verse 19. Where was it in Revelation? Revelation 19. What was 20? Revelation 20 is then when Satan is bound. And the, the trotting down will then begin. What happens in verse 20? And the wine press, there's the second time it's used in Revelation 14, was trodden down without the city and blood came up the wine press. Oh, that's right. Another one. 
Wait, was it the wine press that I wanted? Da, 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 da. Let me double check. Yeah, there you go. And the wine press, even unto the horse's bridles. Now, you see how interesting that is? That brings us to what? Well, chapter to year, that's 20, which would be the end of 13 years, or the typology is the end of the 20th year. So the end of 20 or the end of 13 is like the very start of 21 or the very start of 14. So you can bring that to Zechariah chapter 14. What happens in Zechariah chapter 14? <clears throat> we see that the Lord, look at what it says, for I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle and the city shall be taken and the house ripe and the women ravaged. Verse three, then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. Which means he had another day of battle. Which one was it? At the end of seals when he defeated Antichrist and those who came against. So he had one battle and this is his second one. When he comes what? Feet down on the Mount of Olives. And what do we see? He gathers them about. Their eyes are going to melt in their sockets. Their tongue is going to stick to the root of their mouth as their flesh burns. I mean, it's pretty crazy in Zechariah 14. Where is it connected to? That end of 13, start of 14. W what is trumpets? Matthew. Where's the only other place it's found in all of the Gospels, one time in Matthew 21, to trumpets. And in Matthew, you saw one group sent out, a second group larger sent out, and then the Lord sent out. And what did it say about the Lord? The Son, when he sent the Father, sends out the Son. That they killed him. What? That they killed him, right? This is when he's returning to tread the great wine press, right? This is when gather them and then he returns and he's destroying them. So you got 19 to 20. You've got verse 19 to verse 20. You've got chapter 19 to chapter 20. You've got verse four, uh, chapter 14 to year 14, which is starts with as the end of 20 to the beginning of 21. Well, what about John? What do you think we get in John? Do you think there's something in John 19 into John 20? Do you think it's just all going to be maybe just a, a whimsical coincidence? <clears throat> Let's go see what happens. In I want to see. Do I want to go to John first? No. Let's go see what happens. Let's go to Zechariah chapter 11 before he returns feet down on the Mount of Olives. And what did we see? We see this is the time when Satan's going to be cast down. The vintage of old has come down. We see Messiah is going to be cut off, right? He's going to cut them all off. See, it says, and I took my staff, even beauty, in Zechariah 11, 10, and 11, it says, and I took my staff, even beauty, and cut it asunder, that I might break my covenant, which I had made with all people. That's what he made at the end of seals to the beginning of trumpets. He's the one that makes that covenant and has to break it because Satan's been cast down now. Okay. Verse 11. And it was broken in that day. What do they offer for him? 30 pieces of silver. For those that have been around for a while, you know this story. If you go look for anybody that's new and you go look at the story in Luke, Mark, and Matthew, when Judas deceived him, right? When Judas betrayed Jesus, I should say, you'll see in Luke, it only says money. In Mark, I think it says money as well. It maybe even says silver. But only in Matthew's gospel does it say 30 pieces. Only in Matthew does it tell you the exact number of pieces why do you think that is well it just so happens that it's zechariah 11 which is the chapter 
after three and a half years of the Son of Man being here on Mount Zion as high priest Zerubbabel and king, while the temple was being rebuilt after, <coughs> excuse me, after he made the covenant with all people after destroying the Antichrist, bringing in, sealing the 144, bringing in the rapture group until Satan is cast out at which point Messiah is cut off and he breaks the covenant. This is the seven years Daniel that everybody gets confused about. It has nothing to do with seals because the first seven years of seals is where Matthew has been dispersed, right? They're gone throughout all nations. The land is at rest. They'll only build the foundation during seals. So here's where we see <coughs> Messiah being cut off. And it just so happens that it's the midpoint of trumpets, which is Matthew. It just so happens it's Zechariah 11, which is equivalent to the midpoint of trumpets where Messiah is cut off. It just so happens Zechariah 8 says the rebuilding is now going to start of the city and the streets and the temple on the foundation that was already laid, which happened during seals. So what happens when Messiah is getting cut off? Okay, we know Satan's been cast down. We've got the typology in the chapters to years as to the why Matthew tells us 30 pieces of silver, but Mark and Luke don't. This is all part of the mysteries that we've been talking about being revealed once you come to understand who the Gospels are speaking to. It is prophecy built in for purpose. And the purpose is the revelation of the is to come. So you see, <clears throat> there we've got the understanding for our 30 pieces of silver. We're following this understanding for the, um, for the wine press, which we know the wine press is directly connected <coughs> is directly connected when he comes for that final battle remember the one in revelation 17 it's king of kings and lord of lords but only the k for king and the l for lord right in both cases are the only ones that are uppercase that's the first battle this is the second one at the wine press and that's why these connections are in chapter 19 into chapter 20 with the destruction of Satan when he returns feet down. Because Satan, when Messiah is cut off, <coughs> excuse me, Satan's going to have two and a half years to rule and reign before the Lord returns after 13, at the beginning of 14, feet down on the Mount of Olives, destroys them, binds them at the end, right? Same typology at the end of 20, start of 21, binds them, and then he's gone for a thousand years. He renews the earth. He destroys all the other enemies. Renews the earth. Renews Jerusalem. Water flows from out, right? We know that whole story. What's everything connected to? 19 going into 20 slash that 21, right? 13 into 14. We just saw that it was also connected here with Zechariah. But we're going to see something happening in the same 19 to 20 connected in John as well. And you're going to see how 19 to 20. <laughs> which is also saying 12 and 13 when we're talking about the book of Zechariah. You see, 12 and 13 for Zechariah, 19 and 20 for John, okay? 12 to 13th year, and when it's over, it's just like 19 and 20. So you've got this 19, 20, 12, 13 connection going through these chapters to your books. And I'm bringing it up for a reason. This connection to the wine press. You saw this connection to this year timing and to who's involved and how it's Matthew's portion. But now, I'm going to show it to you by continuing to follow in Zechariah. Look what happens from Zechariah 11 now when you get to Zechariah 12. In Zechariah 12, we had learned earlier in Zechariah in previous teachings that in Zechariah, you know, uh, three, four, going into six, we know that Joshua is the typology of Yeshua Messiah, 
he is the high priest and king he's going to share it with zerubbabel who's going to be the one overseeing the rebuilding while messiah is with the 144,000 as the high priest directly in communication with the father and the 144,000 go out the lord follows them where they go and that's exactly what you see at the beginning of revelation chapter 14 which is the seventh year right revelation 14 had a similarity had the same typology in the big picture side of being the 14th chapter of revelation and what do we know happens in the seventh year of seals the 144,000 are sealed hence the lord there on mount zion with the 144,000 with them because he's high priest and king so what happens now when you get to Zechariah chapter 12 messiah's got he's been cut off and satan's been cast down messiah's cut off so now it's telling us something is about to happen to messiah this is prophetic listen to it Zechariah 12 verse 10 and i will pour upon the house of david and upon the inhabitants of jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced now they haven't pierced him yet but they're going to look upon him who they have pierced let me ask you this he's talking about when he's going to return after having been pierced how on earth are people from 2000 years ago going to look upon him the resurrection won't have happened yet hello listen to what it says and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced and they shall mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and shall be in bitterness for him as one is in bitterness for his firstborn in that day there shall be a great mourning in jerusalem as the morning of harmageddon in the valley of megiddo when does this battle take place hello the battle of armageddon prophetic well then what about this pierced is this pierced prophetic how is it that they're going to look upon him who they have pierced you see we've been taught this in a way that's been twisted because we've all been taught from a foundation of Matthew. All of your pastors, all of your teachers, because they have not understood the revelation of the Gospels and who they're speaking to, their timing prophetically, and the time frame of the end of days and what takes place in the end of days, they can never understand what this is saying prophetically. He is going to be pierced again. You see, this is that thing we don't like to talk about, right? That he's going to, again, he's going to have to do it again, right? We've talked on this. We've got a video called Again. But I want you to take note. He's not pierced here yet, right? We know it's a two and a half year battle. And as one of the two witnesses, he's killed by the end of the two and a half years, right? At the end of the sixth trumpet, he goes up and he will return as King of Kings and Lord of Lords and destroy the enemy bind satan right so that which brings us to revelation 19 into 20. so look what happens listen to the wording when they've pierced them there will be a group of people who shall mourn them as one mourns an only son and with bitterness as a firstborn watch this let me show you something here just so happens we go into john 19. It just so happens we go into John 19. Remember? 19, 20, right? 13 into 14. Watch what happens. I don't know if I taught on this a long time ago or not. But you see this? Talking about Jesus being pierced. Well, did you ever catch this before? I might have taught on it a long time ago. Watch this. John 19, 34 and 37. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side and forthwith came there out blood and water. And he that saw it bear record 
and his record is true, and he knoweth that he saith is true, that ye might believe. For these things were done, that the scripture should be fulfilled, a bone of him shall not be broken. Check this out. This word pierced is used one time. What? Wait a second. Isn't the word pierced right here? This is why a program like Esword and you get KJV, you can get all sorts of variations of scripture. KJV and I use KJV plus and it has the Strong's Concordance so that you can get these understandings of these word definitions because they are vastly important. This word means nudge. What have we been told? This is going to blow your mind. It's going to make you scratch your head and say, oh my goodness, no way. This word for pierced, which is used one single time, is the word that means nudge. Does nudge sound like I just speared you to death and made you immovable? No, it doesn't, does it? Because it isn't. What? To pierce, which is used one time, it does not mean transfix. They've put the word transfix here. It does not mean transfix, and I'm going to prove it to you. Okay? So the word pierce, used one time. What does the word pierced mean as the word for definition? What is the definition? It means to prick. To prick. If I said I was going to prick you, would you be devastated that I was going to jab you right through and make you immovable and kill you? No. A prick is like, is like a thumbtack. It would appear that the soldier with this spear only pricked him. This is the first death of Christ. Oh, oh, there was still water and blood that came out. I'm not saying any of this wasn't true. The record he bared was true. But it wasn't a full-on pierced through. I am not making this up. I am giving you the definition, which means to prick. What does to prick mean? Listen to this. Make a small hole in something with a sharp point. Pierce slightly. It's like, a, it's like getting an earring for women. It's like getting a needle. It's like pricking yourself with a thumbtack. So what is this saying? Well, Jesus was already dead. He didn't need to fully gouge him. It was just enough to prick him, and there was blood and water that came out. I don't mean it was necessarily as small as like a thumbtack. That's not what I'm saying. Because there was blood and water. But it wasn't a, a death blow in the sense that I believe we've all been taught. Not according to the description. Do you realize this word for to prick is only used once? And it's about the one that already happened. It was enough for blood and water, but it wasn't the death blow. Because he was already dead. The soldier realized he didn't need to give him a full death blow. Remember what happened to the soldier when he saw that and all these things happened? He knew that it was the Lord. Oh my goodness. And he freaked out. Right? And he gave his life to Christ. Does that sound like the guy that would just and just jab him right through? You know why? Because that jabbing, that pierce never happened yet. Remember we have the video called Again? Well, how about we read John 19, 37. And again, another scripture. If I ever tell you, and again, that means something again, right? And again, another scripture says, they shall look on him who they, whom they pierced to transfix. To transfix. This word is used two times. 
What does it say they're going to do this time? This again and another scripture says they shall look on him who they pierced in a transfixed pierced. Where did we find this other pierced? Didn't this pierce say that they will see him? They will mourn and be in bitterness as a firstborn only son? And there just so happens to be, again, another scripture that says it, that they shall look upon him who they pierced. When Christ died the first time on the cross and was pierced in the in the slight version, do you think any of those people are going to be alive when he returns feet down on the Mount of Olives? Are they all going to be alive and say, oh, Jesus, whom we've pierced? No. They're all dead and gone. The resurrection of the dead doesn't happen until after he returns. In fact, I can prove it to you in Revelation 11. We know at the seventh trumpet, look at this. Okay, second woe, they're all freaking out because he's returning feet down on the Mount of Olives. And the seventh trumpet sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. He's returning feet down on the Mount of Olives. Revelation 10 says, at the beginning of the sound of the seventh trumpet, the mystery shall be complete. It's over. And then what happens? Then it talks about the wrath and the resurrection and the judging of the prophets and the reward of the servants. When he returns feet down on the Mount of Olives, I mean, you could even go to Zechariah 14. Zechariah 14, when he returns feet down on the Mount of Olives. There's going to be a very great valley and the mountain shall divide. You see, people will flee. There'll be a great earthquake. He's going to gather them together. They're going to go out. They're going to be destruction is coming. He shall be king over all the earth, you see, just like the seventh trumpet. Is there any resurrection yet? No, he's destroying all the enemies first. So the only way he could return feet down on the Mount of Olives after having been pierced and people saying, oh my goodness, the one that we pierced, this is him. Oh, I can't believe it. Would be if they were alive. Hence, Zechariah chapter 12 the prophetic talking about when he's coming that they'll see him who they've pierced hence john chapter 19 and i'm going to prove it to you more in john chapter 19 the reason for this second pierce not being the same as the first because the first one was a prick meaning a light one that caused blood and water to come out but it wasn't this fatally decisive blow that ended it all Listen to what it says. They shall look on him who, whom they've pierced. And that word is to transfix. What's the difference between prick to slightly prick with a sharp point and transfixed? To transfix is cause someone to become motionless with horror. Pierce with a sharp implement or weapon. It's to render somebody motionless with a death blow. Brothers and sisters, the transfixed spear has not happened yet. It is terrifying to think about. It is troubling, but we've been here before. We've studied on these things in again and in other revelations. We have proven it will happen again. And the glorious thing is we know why. It is terrible what they're going to do that's going to cause them to have to do it again. But it is, it is all for the glory of God. It is all for his glory. All for the Father's glory and will.
It's okay. He's not staying dead. He'll return after three and a half days, stand up, come down, bang, and then return feet down on the Mount of Olives. And they will all witness him whom they have pierced. Well, you see this word is only used twice. Check out the other place. Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1. Where was it? <clears throat> Revelation chapter 1. Verse 7. Do you think it's coincidence? It's in Revelation. Listen to what it says. See, remember, this, this, in a lot of cases, a lot of people try to understand when this is. This is the end. Even though it's Revelation chapter 1, it's talking about the end. Listen, listen to verse 5, and we'll go down from there. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness. Oh, he's a witness, right? And the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. You see, that his first death and resurrection, that was for everybody. That was for the whole world. The second one is for another reason. If you've been in this ministry, you know what it is. Verse 6, And he hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. Well, we're not kings and priests until the resurrection. You see, until the resurrection at the end of tribulation to rule and reign with him for the millennial reign. It's not till the end. And he hath made us kings and priests unto God and his father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he cometh with clouds. And every eye shall see him. When do you think this is? This is the end of trumpets when he returns feet down on feet down on the Mount of Olives. And they also, which, there it is, which pierced him. And all kindreds <coughs> of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. You want proof? You want extra evidence? even though most don't even want to hear it, and I don't blame you. There it is right there, brothers and sisters. When he comes in the clouds and every eye shall see him, comma, and maybe I should highlight that, something we know very, very well in this ministry, comma, and. And every eye shall see him, comma, and, they also which pierced him. This pierced just so happens to be John chapter 19, talking about the second pierced, which is the, again as we've taught, connected to every eye that will see him, which is connected to the revelation of the end of trumpets from Revelation chapter 1. And what do you think Revela uh, John chapter 20 talks about? What do you think? Do you think it's just a, a, a coincidence that John chapter 20, right? So remember John chapter 20 and these things, it could be a reference to the end of chapter 20. It's like the end of the 20th year to the beginning of the 14th, okay? It's like it's right on this line dividing the two. In Zechariah chapter 14, at the beginning, we see the Lord returning feet down on the Mount of Olives. In John chapter 20, it's a typology of the end of the 20th year. And what do we see in John chapter 20? Verse nine, for as yet they knew not the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Wow. Brothers and sisters, it just keeps revealing itself over and over and over again. How these things aren't always fun, right? I don't get a kick 
out of talking about Christ doing this again. I don't enjoy it. But you know what I enjoy? I enjoy diligently seeking him and the ability to understand the revelation of our Lord and Savior. This is the ministry that has been blessed with the revelation of Jesus Christ. We spoke today of Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, all the way to Revelation chapter 20. And a number of things in between. How is that possible? How are these connections to the end of days possible? It all began with the revelation of who the Gospels are speaking to. Once you understand who they're speaking to, and you understand that the last shall be first and the first shall be last, once you understand it's Luke, Mark, and Matthew, pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib, you'll finally understand why the discourses are speaking so different. Why Matthew's continues so much longer into 25. Why Luke's is so short. Pre, mid, and post. A lot of people have been confused and avoid talking about the fact that Antichrist is not Satan. Because Revelation 16, 13 says, And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. There are three. Just like the Father, the Son, and the Spirit as one they are working perfectly in unison as one and these guys are the enemy working in unison as one but they are clearly three once you grasp the differences in the gospels and their time frames you will understand how there's the antichrist and the dragon and that the dragon is not the antichrist when the dragon Satan is cast down and he opens the pit at mid trumpets, the Antichrist is coming back with all those coming out of the pit that are the beasts and the dragons. When the Lord returns, the first two that are destroyed are the beast and the false prophet. The beast and the false prophet are the first two thrown into the lake of fire. The dragon is going to be given a thousand years being bound. And when it's all over, he is cast in and the great judgment and those going to the left will join these guys in the lake of fire. The only way you could understand there are three is when you understand who the discourses are speaking to, that you can understand Mark is the time of the Antichrist and false prophet. At the end of seals and Mark's portion, Antichrist is killed, false prophet is not. When you get to Matthew, only false prophet is there during the first half of trumpets, but it's like he's in hiding. Once uh, mid trumpets comes, the rebuilding has been done, Messiah is cut off, Satan is cast down, the pit is opened, and even worse, than there ever was even at the midpoint of Mark seals. Now at the midpoint of trumpets, it'll be the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet all together with all that comes out of the pit. It'll be worse than the worseness of what Mark was at mid seals. It is a beautiful thing to comprehend. And I do not take joy in talking about all of it but I take joy in the revelation of understanding it because it is the revelation of our Lord. And it's beautiful. You'll see in the 14 years video, the revelation of where it all started. A man in Christ above 14 years ago, like a rapture, 
to the third heaven and then another one kind of like the first but not really in christ like the first one was and this one was caught up this is the rapture to paradise and then he talks about the third time now he's coming to them and he won't bring any more burden upon them pre mid post it's all true and it all begins in the 70th year of israel with 50 days before the year's end. At the year's end, the 70 years of Israel will be complete according to the Lord God's time, and the 14 years of tribulation will begin with the attack on Jerusalem by Syria having compassed about and then bringing destruction upon them. And brothers and sisters, as I speak to you now, I believe in the possible probability of the revelation of the count of the moon and that the sun, even though it is off two months, its revelation is covered by Savan Taurus being observed four months early, hence the harvests being allowed to be in their two months early position because the Lord will have taken care of his Taurus first fruits harvest because Deuteronomy tells us it is seven days as years of affliction for Mark's group tells us it is seven days as years for the tabernacles matthew portion and it is a single day event of the feast of weeks free will tribute offering that will be observed four months early if john 4 is for us brothers and sisters i believe at the end of this weekend We'll be home. I hope, I pray, we will continue to diligently seek, and I pray that the teachings will continue to bless you and strengthen you and get you to dig deeper and deeper into His Word until the time that we go, because it is a blessing and an honor for me to be able to share it, and it'll bless you in being able to understand it and to draw closer and closer to him. I love you guys. God bless you. God bless your families. We'll talk to you soon or see you sooner. Bye for now.